All right. Cool country there. Welcome. You are listening to WHIV 102.3 FM, and this is a new show. I was going to call it Right Now, but I found out that Van Halen had a song on that, so I might change it to Monkey Mind with Rob Owen. This show is all about brain cancer and being in your moment. Uh, so that is the gist of it. 14 years ago, I got diagnosed with a GBM uh, brain cancer. And it pretty much gave me six months to live. <laughs> so I was a little, uh, wow. Anyway, so it's 14 years later, so that's pretty good. Uh, I took a lot of stuff. The monkey mind thing comes into, and the right now also, which I won't use, but it comes from like Eckhart Tolle. I noticed that way back, like, 15, 16 years ago, I had a lot of negative speak in my head. It was very much connected with my ego. And if you're not familiar, like Eckhart's really big on uh, uh, kind of getting with your uh, core self, maybe not your ego. So that thing inside you that can basically listen to your thoughts. And then uh, that's uh, kind of what he's about. So that was a big, a big uh, plus for me. And uh, helped, I thought, with my healing process. So on the origins of that, just to talk about brain cancer some, it's kind of spooky. Nobody ever, I don't think, ever thinks that they're going to have brain cancer, right? I was like, what? But uh, and a good friend of mine wrote a book on it where she said, say what? Or something like that. That's pretty cute. But, uh, yeah, so it's like I started out with, like, headaches. And uh, like I said, I think I lowered – my immune system with a lot of negative speak. Uh, and so that's a key thing on just preventative. I think on just staying positive with yourself and forgiving yourself, loving yourself. But uh, yeah, the, um, yeah, it was tough with the whole, I was trying to get some music right here. Oh, it's more. Have some background. So this is my good, uh, I'll keep this on the background. Keep me some music. I like that. But this is my good friend Red playing on guitar, Monkey Mind. And that's like one of the key things is what like the uh, Buddhist monks call your, your thought process, uh, that voice in your head. It's like a monkey, and the monkey just wants to do something. doesn't care if it's bad or good. It just wants something to do. It's something to think about. It can just kind of drive you nuts. For me back, I guess I had a, a job I wasn't that excited about, and I thought I really hadn't followed my – dreams and stuff like that so I was getting really down on myself I was having a rough time at home with marriage mortgage all that kind of good stuff job etc and I guess the stress just built up and that kind of coincided with uh, Katrina too so that that was kind of like a perfect storm for, for stress levels and I think it just lowered my immune system and I had a brain origin uh, cancer so it, it started in my brain. It didn't metastasize out of my body. I guess I should stay on the front end. I am not a doctor. And I get a lot of this stuff mixed up. And I got my own kind of personal views on this. So take it with a grain of salt. And, uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's been a trip, a total trip. But I'm grateful for it. And I think that's something to, to take away with your life experience that, that just have gratitude for for what is your moment and, and really notice your moment more. So back to the origins of it, it was pretty weird. So I just was stressing a lot. Like I said, I think I was suffering from depression, had a lot of anxiety too. I was definitely not living in my moment too much. And uh, it just got to got worse and worse. And I started getting these headaches and, uh, and I thought I was getting the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, migraines because my family has a history of it i had never had a migraine before i had headaches but nothing that and i just thought wow these are really brutal because they would take every thought i had and just clear it out they had the pain in it and what it was was the tumor of course was was growing and it was building up pressure and it had no way to release it so it would just i guess fry your brain with a headache and uh so i then i my natural impulse was trying to keep things together and keep it Keep it going. I had the job, had the you know the the 
family at home. So I was trying the best, but I was also hide that. <laughs> and that just kind of snowballed me and caused more stress. And not the good kind of stress. There's like a good stress, which is like a healthy, I guess, animal aspect. And then there's the other kind, which is just that negative feeling that just gets you down. And that's what I was having. That just, you know, anxious, not good. It wasn't like pumping me up to, uh, to do more. So, uh, yeah, and then with that, I guess, came some seizures, too, where I was having that epi grand mal or something like that, they call it, where you, like, black out, you go on the floor, and you just start shaking. You don't remember any of it. Then you come, to. So <laughs> I was a mess. But I was holding down a job, and I was, like, trying to keep it together with the marriage. And, uh, but, yeah, not, not too good. I, I was doing a poor job. And then it came to the point where it was like, okay, something's wrong. And I went to like go see a therapist, tried to get on antidepressants. Uh, and during that journey, trying to, do, trying to figure out, because I did not think I had brain cancer. Um, I just thought I was getting stupid <laughs> and I was getting migraines. But uh, so it was just kind of embarrassed and I just felt bad. So it just kind of snowballed that whole negativity. And, uh, which goes back to the thing is like, love yourself and forgive yourself, you know? Uh, and just keep that as like your constant little mantra, I think. So yeah, so then I'm going to like a, uh, I think it ended up with a chiropractor that I liked. And he said, Rob, something's, something's weird with you, man. <laughs> it doesn't sound right. I was just thinking maybe it was like a pinch, a pinch nerve or something like that. Call, I'm gonna take that. So, uh, and the, uh, yeah, so it was just really, I forget where we're even at on that. So I, I, I'm really absent-minded from this. So I have a large jump, jump of a couple of years, and I, I, they removed a big chunk of my right frontal lobe. And uh, so what are we at for that phone? Man? That was like, a, I don't know what that was. Maybe another doctor appointment. Anyway, so the... Uh, Yeah, the, uh, I'm not at that point. Wow, I cleared up all my things at one phone call. So the, <laughs> see, okay, I have a little brain damage, sorry. But I mean, it's, it's also about just being easy on yourself. And it's such a, a lesson in life, you know? It's like, you can get all these things and we're all gonna die, right? So it's like, I think it's so much about making peace with your moment, really noticing your moment and, uh, and that, I mean, it's, it's really just going back to that and, and forgiving yourself for messing up and, you know, loving others and, you know, treating others as you would yourself, of course. So with the, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember where I was on that story. So, okay, so I had, I can remember. <laughs> See, this is what it's like. It's brutal. But, I mean, we all have, abs I mean, I had absent-minded stuff all the time, even before I had a lot. Of, I was talking about the loss of brain tissue. That was it. Yeah, so. No, that was a, the forward story. Wow, I'm really losing it. Anyway, I'll, I'll come back to it. The, uh, oh yeah, so I was at the uh, chiropractor. That was it. <laughs> so the chiropractor, he, uh, he was like, Rob, this ain't adding up, man. You got something. You need to go see my friend who's a uh, neurologist or something like that. So I went and saw this other brain guy, and it was pretty casual. It was like, I don't even think it was insurance related or nothing. And he's like, listen, you need to get an MRI right away because this doesn't sound right. And, uh, so I did that, and I went to, I actually knew another friend that was doing MRIs at, uh, at Oshner at the time. And this is right after Katrina, so things were stressed for the whole city and hospitals and everybody. So he got me in there, like, right away, and he took the MRI. And my wife and my kids, I guess, we'd all gone as, like, a caravan or something. I don't know. And uh, we are in the lobby, like, waiting, and it was, like, this weird little building out in the Oshner parking lot because all the radiation and so I guess to dissipate, to lessen that effect. Anyway, so the guy, he walks by us after my MRI, because he knows what stuff looks like. These guys are pretty savvy. And uh, he goes in, and he's just gone. He doesn't look at me or doesn't say anything, he just walks right out. And then, I guess there was a back door to the place or something like that. I don't even know. But anyway, then in a, in a little bit, because it was a tiny little, it looked like a trailer, sort of, it looked like a kind of a trailer building. 
So then this guy comes out the back or a nurse says, can you go into the back? And then my wife and I would go to the back and we're in this little room and there's this other guy, this doctor turns out looking at like a little TV monitor and it's my brain. And he's like, you've got a really large, uh, brain tumor and we needed to have surgery like right away <laughs> and I'm like wow all right but it was kind of like there was a certain relief because you're like god at least that's what's wrong with me man um, so that was so then they checked me in like right away over to Oshner and uh then we did uh I guess brain surgery like either the next day or the day after that where they checked me in and prepped me and and uh and that was a huge the ironic thing I won't Drop too many names on this to protect the uh, guilty and the innocent. But uh, my uh, surgeon's name, his nickname was God. <laughs> and my joke was always like, I never knew that was because he was killing people or saving them. But, uh, but yeah, that night I just really had that, you know, like epiphanies when like you're like, wow, you know, I'm going to have brain surgery tomorrow to remove some, you know, really big tumor in my head. And it's like this, you know, might be. The, you know, the it for me. And I was like, damn, okay, pretty heavy. Did a lot of pottery that, that night. Just on, I don't even know if I slept at all. And, uh, and then the next day, I remember getting prep or whenever they were getting prepped for the surgery, and we were in their room, and they were giving me, uh, what do you call it, anesthesia to knock me out. And I remember before that, I got the doctor, and I said, listen, you know, I've got, I've got a young, my youngest daughter, I want to make it to 18 for her. For her 18th birthday so let's uh do a good job get me through this <laughs> and then i then i think i went to trying to sell them board shorts and uh and t-shirts and apparel because i had a, a retail shop at the time it was a the new orleans surf shop so i may have had that brain cancer for a while they don't really know <laughs> since i started a, a surf shop in new orleans but uh but yeah it's pretty funny but uh crazy after the surgery too it was like all these epiphanies i felt so kind of like connected to the universe i don't know it's just this beautiful like like it was like some kind of high when you're on you know drugs or something where you're tripping or something and everything just syncs up and it's just beautiful and you just feel connected to just your your life and i just felt great and then it went from that to then going to the rehab room where i was up for like i don't know i was like two days I could they couldn't put me on meds because they were worried about the brain and then the doctor told me that I couldn't move my head or I'd mess up the stitches so he didn't tell me that I was pretty solid I could have actually moved around a lot more but I was just really trying to be a good patient and uh, do what I could to survive um, but I mean they kept me up all night the, the people were the nurses were just so rude in that uh, that uh, rehab place or it's called something like your it's not an emergency room. It's like the place where you, from your surgery you go and you like rehab. You don't go back to your room right away. So they watch you. They can watch it. But they like, it was their rumpus room for, uh, for talking, for studying, for, and so they just, you know, they made noise. So I was just agitated. And so I lost my epiphany pretty soon after. But say la vie. I still remember it. But uh, the, uh, yeah, so then after that, it was like all high fives, and, and <laughs> I remember they were all around my, uh, my bed when I, when I first came to, and um, they were like looking at me like if I was going to do anything, or like, was I going to really come to, and, uh, and I think they were all pretty, <laughs> they were pretty relieved when I started talking like afterwards and stuff like that, because it's like, I guess, because you're, you're removing, you know, brain tissue, so you don't no, 100% what you're, what you're taking out. So that's the uh, spooky thing. And I guess with the, uh, the whole cancer, why they call it that is because the, the crab, like the legs of it, you know, it splinters out from its initial uh, thing. So it's, it's, and the presentation I had had going into it was like this was basically going to cure me. And then afterwards, they pretty much immediately thereafter acted like that. Like everybody was like, yeah, you know, it's like you did it. And it's like, we beat this or something. And then and it was like, I don't know, once I got back to my room or something, and then I got to meet, I guess it's the oncologist. I mixed some of this stuff up, so sorry. But uh, 
And then the oncologist was this, this looked like this pretty old guy. And he almost seemed like he was down in the basement over at the hospital. So I went and saw him with my wife at the time. And uh, I mean, it just seemed depressing. <laughs> he seemed really sad because it looked like he was just basically killing people. And then I get to find out that the surgery can't really do it and doesn't really do it with, with brain cancer especially because you can't just remove all the, all the tumor. Um, so that was like a real like gut check. I was like, oh, man, because I thought I'd, I'd uh, you know, dodged it. And it, I never had a headache after that initial brain surgery. It was really bizarre. And to this day, I haven't really had one. I'm going to say I haven't really had a headache. I mean, maybe a little bit after drinking a ton, but really not. Uh, it's kind of weird. But uh, so that was, that was a blessing right there. But uh, yeah, so then I, I heard from that guy too, you know, the, the protocols just weren't working. And what I was diagnosed, yeah, brain cancer is serious. And most brain cancers go to what's called a GBM. And that's like a, I never even really wanted to learn the proper pronunciation but it's like a glioblastoma or something like that but anyway it's like a four you know like cancers going like i think they all go into like a one two three four and uh so it's like a four um and most brain cancers go to that for some reason i don't really know maybe it's like constricted area um but mine was in at least a decent spot for surgery in my right frontal lobe and uh so yeah, so, but, but meeting this doctor, man, it was like going to a dungeon. And I was like, man, I do not want to be treated here. I just don't feel right. And that was a big part that I always cued in on was getting good vibes, feelings for my doctor. Like, I always wanted to really like my, because this is like your life. You might as well go out with somebody that you kind of like. And granted, you know, there's, you know, that's, that's a job and stuff like that. But, but you like that, that kind of sense of it. And uh, so that always kept me more positive because I was in like a, I think a, like a long distance, you know, marathon. This wasn't some, like some sprint then at that point. I knew that I was in for a long haul, a long time. Um, years later, I would find out a lot of stuff that I didn't know back then, which is a little bit more daunting. Like a lot of times I won't even say cancer. I won't, I won't, uh, what do you call it? Give it life to say that, you know, I have something like that because I, I just don't want to empower it. And I think your mind is an incredible uh, tool for healing. Uh, and so I like to see like the ignorance is bliss and all that. But uh, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, so it's pretty dope. So after that, um, my dad offered to, uh, helped me go get a second opinion at uh, MD Anderson in Houston. And so I was game for that. Just prior to that, I was just noted because I'd gotten checked out. And that's one thing, man, getting out of, getting out of the hospital is a big thing because it just tore me up just on being in the bed. Uh, just, you just waste away so quick. It's, it's so hard on the body. And uh, I remember going to uh, – uh, one of the things you had to do is prove that you could use the bathroom and a lot of the, the, the medication and stuff they had put me on causes constipation and they had mixed up my uh, stool softener with medication with something else. Like they just made a, a, an honest mistake. <laughs> I mean, I thought I was going to black out naked on the fall on the toilet in, the, in my bathroom floor and black out from that one. But uh, I was like, sad. oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah, and I also had to, did I have to show? Oh, yeah, because I think they had to do some injection. Like, there was some kind of uh, uh, seizure. Like, you'd have to take, a, like, a syringe and stick yourself and, and shoot it, like, in your stomach or, or something like that, like a fatty part of your, your body. You could do it in your butt or you could do it in your, in my case, it was my little, my little fat over my uh, stomach. And uh, so that would be that. And, uh, but I had to show it. And I was like, oh, I'm not having no problems doing that. I could do that easy. So anyway, the moral of the story is I ended up pooping. So that worked. So I proved that. And I peed, I guess, or something like that. So you take out the catheter and all that stuff. And uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
So, uh, so yeah, I remember that was just like your foot. It's, it's so funny what your life can turn into what, like what really matters. And it's like going to the potty. It was like, <laughs> I remember I was like, man, I just want to go to the bathroom so I can get out of here. <laughs> and it was like, I really had to focus on that. And, uh, I said one time in that hospital, I had, I had total like paralysis on my left body where it, it wasn't that long, but it was like, it was pretty freaky where I could not move, you know, cause the right frontal lobe, I couldn't move any, like my fingers or like sitting, you know, you're sitting there staring at your hand you just can't, can't move it. It was pretty bizarre. But, uh, so yeah, I got checked out of there. Oh, but before that too, they were supposed to make me demonstrate that, uh, I could eat myself with that, uh, I think it was like a blood thinner, so I wouldn't clot, which turned out to be a bust, but I'll, I'll tell you that in a sec. So this is like stories if you get stuck with, with cancer, I guess. This is a story. Uh, uh, damn, what was that? The, oh, the seizure. Okay, so I'm, yeah, so I'm at home. For the first time, I have to give myself this injection. And it was pretty funny because I was real cocky in the hospital. Like, yeah, I think I'm having problems sticking myself with a needle. Uh, yeah, you get out of here. Heck yeah. Well, I've been through, but then I get home and I'm sitting there like a, like a dart board where I'm just about to stick myself with this needle. And I was like, it took me, it took me a little bit to do it. And, uh, I wasn't that excited. And then it turned out like morphing my, kind of my stomach, I guess, cause I'd shot myself right-handed. So I shot myself so many times in the same side of the stomach. So then you had to move it around, but it's kind of weird. But then it turned, okay, so then I get the kind of negative that, uh, uh, so I get the negative that, you know, this is, this is, uh, I was getting all these pains. Like I had, like I had broken ribs and uh, I contacted the hospital. And then anyway, so that I met with that guy and he said, it's, it's really bad. Um, you're gonna, you got about six months to live. So my dad, then we flew to MD Anderson. He's like, yeah, they looked at me right away. He's like, oh, you have blood clots all over you. That's why you feel like you broke your ribs. And uh, so then he checked me in. The, the head guy at, at MD Anderson checked me in right away and uh, into the hospital and started getting me on, treating me all. I think they put a stint or something. Because I was what was happening was I was getting air bubbles that were flowing through my lungs. And so it was making me feel like my ribs were all broken. And it was, <laughs> I had, a, I had someone tell me that after they had given, they'd had, a, there was a woman that said, uh, I've never seen anyone suffer this much or something like that. And I have, I've had a child. <laughs> it would hurt. It hurt a lot. Anyway, so when I checked in at MD Anderson, so then I was like, okay, I want to stick in Houston. And so my dad was real sweetheart and then set me up and my family like apartment down there because I didn't really have the money to, to square that. And uh, so then that was my treatment. I, I, I stayed over there, loved the head guy, but everything he told me was bad. He was like, all right, I think you've got a, uh, you've got a GBM. You've got a four brain cancer. It's big, it's uh, aggressive. And he wanted to go in and do a, you know, do a biopsy, a thorough biopsy. So he's just going on the MRIs at that point. And maybe some tissue from Oscar. I'm not 100% on that. But on what he saw, he was like, this is, you know, life-threatening. You know, of course, like, I'd already heard six months. And uh, so he checked me in, and they did the stint, and they took care of the uh, that uh, blood clots that I have. Because that's very common on any time you have a knee surgery or uh, uh, brain surgery. You really want to monitor your uh, blood clots like that and get on some good uh, blood thinners while you're going through that. It's very common, very common. And I don't know why they didn't catch it. I was, just, and I got really mad at, at God after that for not, the doctor that is, for not catching that. And uh, so that kind of hurt me. So I was really excited to get with somebody that was spooking me, but I liked him. It was this, it was uh, head of, uh, I guess, oncology, I, I forget. But over at MD Anderson, he was like a redheaded guy, just freaking awesome. But everything he told me was brutal. And, and just scary, <laughs> but there's something about it. I just trusted him, and I with my you know with my life and all that, and uh, so it was it was good. So there they put me on 
kind of pretty much the standard at the time. This is, you know, 14 years ago. So things are kind of stayed the same and they've amped up a little. So what is radiation, uh, and oh, and I did another uh, brain surgery, but they called it a biopsy, but it was longer than the brain surgery tissue remover that I had at Oshner, that first one, which, uh, which took out a big chunk. So I think, and the guy, I think the surgeon at the other place was great. At MD Anderson was pretty cool too. He was like uh, this, this young, good looking Indian guy and real cocky. He was like, I'd have taken out more tissue <laughs> and all this stuff. He was like, a, he just reminded me of like a fighter pilot or something like that. But I really liked him too. And I really liked my uh, other doctor that kind of headed it up. And, uh, so those two were kind of in cahoots, but I really had a good feeling. And I did the same thing to that, that other doctor. I was like, okay, I got it. My youngest, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go for, I'm going for 18 and I'm good. <laughs> and he's like, I'm going to get you there. And I was like, I had no doubt. He had, he had a, a certain swagger. And then, so after that, I, okay, I did the radiation. It's really crazy too. Like they, for brain surgery, I guess because it's so delicate because they can zap all parts of your brain and really fry it. Pretty unhealthy, too. I'm not sure I would do brain radiation again. Um, it fried my – I used to have really long hair. <laughs> not that that's the reason why, but I used to have really long hair, and it zaps, like, your hair follicles. Like, where black, it's going through, you know, your, your skull, your, you know, your outer skin to get into your brain. Um, so just to show what it does, you know, it's your, you like you lose your your hair, so you have all these weird little bald spots where you uh, uh, where the radiation was targeting your tumor. So that was that was pretty bad. Oh, and they they strap you down, like they make this like a plastic hard thing that conforms to your to your your head. So it's like this mask, and uh, they then they you know, those like warps to your face, and then they buckle you down on it, so you're like kind of stuck on this thing. And then they, you know, pull the big old like radar radar down, and they just zap you, kind of like a, I guess, a dentist office, but a, a more crazier looking thing. And uh, yeah, so that was pretty weird. Didn't hurt, but I mean, my hair, my my hair started falling out, and. Uh, and I was like, I can't do it. And, then, and my, my, all my kids, my wife, Tom, they, oh, you look fine. And I was like, I don't know, y'all. And then I started noticing like the, uh, like that big clumps of my long hair on my pillow the next morning. I was like, man, I ain't doing this. That's gonna look just too weird. So then I started doing the old, uh, I guess, I guess I shaved my head way back then, yeah. So I just buzzed it off. And uh, yeah, it was kind of a trip. Never thought I could pull off being bald headed, but now I like it. I keep shaving it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I went through, I don't know what the protocol, I really forgot. So pretty much it was with the radiation and the Timidor, and I was doing that uh, at the same time. Uh, had the brain surgery, that was obviously a success for them, I think. What it left me with like this big, like kiwi size kind of space. Like a like a space where they had taken out, and uh, but yeah, I think his his quote biopsy was probably as much or more of a surgery that they had. I maybe they did that for insurance reasons or something like that, but I don't know. But anyway, so that was pretty good. So then I finished up with the radiation treatment protocol. Had a little bit, I want to say, on the Timidar, but my dad and I always argue about that one about. So my, my memory is kind of sketching a lot of this stuff. Like I said, I might get some of this stuff pretty wrong. But I finished with the radiation, and then I had a meeting with that, that doctor that I told you about that saw me with the, the head of the department that saw the clots like right away on talking to me. And um, so, <laughs> go away, never mind. All right, so, uh, Oh man, I said that. Someone just distracted me. Okay, so yeah, so the clots. Uh, yeah, okay, so then I had the meeting with him. And he, he, 
pulls up my, I had an MRI then after the radiation treatment. I go to that and he says, it's all worse. Your, your tumor has gotten bigger. It's the, the aggressive portions of it are spreading. Okay, so that in the, yeah, I don't know, I'm mixing some of that story up. But uh, yeah, then it was like, so it was worse. And I was like, oh man. And he's like, I don't think you have time. We're about to do a new protocol. And it was like a real chemo where they inject you and, and just flood you with poison. And, uh, but he was, he was suggesting that I do that. So ironically, it turned out that back in at WestJet over on the West Bank, he had a former colleague that was doing that protocol and I could get on it. So I got in on that on the front end right after my radiation. And, uh, so yeah, so that was pretty, pretty spooky to go through all the process and then find out, you know, things are worse. But I guess that, that kind of syncs up with the, the typical six months. Of, of that so and then ironically in that at that first hospital i was given a eckhart tully uh cd going back to kind of like being in your moment and going back to kind of being positive and healing yourself and i remember listening to it in the hospital oh my god forget that because he has a kind of a weird accent and so i, I didn't like it <laughs> and then i would come back after this back in i guess new orleans and another friend turned me on to it and it's so funny, like so much in life, you can have things that really are there for your healing and for your health that are with you the whole time. It's just like you're not uh, opening up to it, maybe, or, or I don't know, taking notice. Um, like you have the answer the whole time. And, and that, granted, I was getting, I was doing a little bit better with the uh, negative speak and all that kind of stuff and not, and not, and not stressing too much about it, ironically. Uh, but I didn't really have, I mean, I was still doing a little bit, maybe too much of it. And so I started listening to Edgar Tully, and it was all about, you know, being in your moment and, and appreciation and some other stuff that I'll probably blank on. But, uh, but yeah, so back, so then I was back, and then that was just brutal. That was like, I was going to the West Bank and then going up into this hospital room, fluorescent lights, and you're, you know, they've got the, the daytime TVs on. It's like all these uh, game shows. And uh, you're around everybody in the room. It's just so, you know, sickly and stuff like that. It's, it's pretty brutal. You get into your chair and then they, they stick you. And they would have a hard time with sticking me and they wanted to put a port in me, which if you go, I don't, I don't blame you. I just didn't want to do it. I just thought it looked And uh, I didn't really want to have something kind of in my body. And I also didn't choose to do a radiation wafer in my brain that was one option when they were doing the brain surgery they could implant a radioactive chip in your head that just sounded <laughs> too and i think that negates some future treatments so my goal was to keep everything popping and, and hopping like i i just wanted to do all the nasty stuff they could to me every possible thing to see whatever would work and i, I just tried to stay motivated with that and I started listening to the Eckhart Tully CDs, and that really helped me. The key part is just noticing your negative speak in your head and, and really trying not to, to so identify that, that that's you, that you're really the awareness that can hear that thought. It's like you can listen to your own thoughts. That's more, I think, like your uh, eternal kind of thing or your your core thing that's really you which is kind of a beyond ego beyond your hobbies and all that kind of stuff but it's like your i don't know what maybe your your vibration whatever you know whatever is really kind of you so with that i had uh and then afterwards i had uh i was having some seizures and they got me on this medication called kepra and my seizures were from the amount of tissue that was, had been removed. My, my other doctor that I liked a lot from MD Anderson as well, not the head guy, but the, this other guy. I mean, he was my head doctor, this other guy, but the head guy was like the head of MD Anderson's department. So, uh, yeah, so he got uh, Kepra stuff, and that Kepra just stopped my, uh, my seizures. Cause I was doing that, that grand mall thing where you just, I'd, I'd do this weird thing where I would, I would look over my left shoulder and I'd be like, uh Oh, it's about to come. So then I try like sitting down or something like that or 
or pulling over to the side of the road. And uh, I'd be, all right, I'm going to be out for a little bit. But you, you, like, anything that happened, you just all exhausted and just brutal. Um, just sore because you just, you shake. I mean, I wasn't watching it, but people that saw me do it a couple of times were pretty, of course, freaked out by it. And I'm totally out, unconscious. But it didn't last too long. But, uh, but during the latter part, too, I told you about the, I think early on the show, I was telling you about the, I had a retail shop, it was a surf shop. And a lot of times I would work it alone and uh, I'd wake up and I'd be like, what is going on? And I, I was like, I remember one time I woke up and uh, I was on a beach chair because we had like lounge chairs and I was kind of like, you know, like a surfy kind of thing. And I was on this chair and I was all sore. And I called up my wife and I was like, hey, honey, I think I want to come home. I don't, I don't feel good or something like that. And she's like, oh, we need the money, babe. You got to hang in there. I was like, all right. So then I think I called up my friend. Oh, because I had to remember to take my Kepler. And my memory was so bad, I would forget to take my anti-seizure meds. And years later, I used that because my doctor over said I was always going to have to be on it with the amount of tissue that I had removed from my brain that I would never – not need to take the anti-seizure meds. But I noticed years later, as I would continually forget, because I thought it made me kind of groggy. And uh, so, yeah, so it's like, I was like, all right, I'm gonna stop doing this stuff, because I, I just don't think it's working, because I forget to take it all the time, so I haven't had a seizure. And I haven't had a seizure for like 10 years or something like that, or 12 or something. So it's been a really long time, so I was right. Uh, yeah, the other thing about you know, doctors and stuff like that, it's a, it's a weird thing because they're really, no offense to doctors out there, but they're really practicing a lot of this stuff. And a lot of the stuff, like on even what they're basing is, I don't know if it's been really thoroughly researched as much. Like my big kick now is like dietary stuff. Like I'm really trying to, and my current doctor, he doesn't, he doesn't think that, that's because I asked him, is there anything that I can kind of do, be proactive with with my health? And he's like, pretty much not. No, <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, whatever. I mean, that's his opinion. There's nothing wrong with that. And I like the guy too. He's, he's good. But, uh, but yeah, so, oh, I, I kind of jumped to the other part. So that's, uh, so I've been doing MRIs for the last 14 years. Okay, well, I'm going to, okay, I'm not getting to the successful conclusion here. So I'm on the West Jeff, I'm doing chemo, it's brutal, it's gross. Uh, I think I'm one of the only people to ever have completed a Vastin CPT-11 chemotherapy. And I think they're doing, I don't know, I'm not really up on this stuff, but I think that's, been a, it's, that's continuing to be a, a newer success. But I think they may have, because that was a chemo cocktail is what they call it. So I think they've just picked one of them. I think it's a Vastin, but it, it was it was nasty, and they almost pulled because they pull you off if you got too nauseous and sick. If you were like throwing up and stuff, they didn't really put up with that. And my doc told me he's like, listen, because I was doing the same. He said, listen, if you throw up again, I'll have to take you off this meds. We can't do it. And he was giving me all kind of horse pill any seizure meds, but it just didn't work. So I would keep a, a waste paper a little, you know, like one of those little trash cans by my thing, and I'd, I'd do it real quick so no one could see. And I didn't tell anybody else because I, I just wanted to get better. And I, did, I thought it would it'd kill me if they took me off this stuff. So I did not want to. So I, I kind of cheated to get through it. But, uh, and I don't really know what. And then we did some MRIs afterwards, and it kind of looked, everything looked the same. And then he did... So we finished that protocol, that advanced in that chemotherapy. So that was done with. And then I got on, yeah, we just were doing MRIs because they just check your status. You know, like they'll look at it one month and they'll look at the next month. If nothing's changing, then that's cool. If it's getting worse, of course, that's the, you know, not, it's bad. So mine was just staying, look, everything was looking really stagnant. And uh, so that was pretty cool. So he, yeah, so we just went in to just monitor it. And then at a certain point, just to be kind of safe, he took some kind of CT scan or something. But this one was a really focused on a blood, uh, uh, you know, just monitor the brunt. It was like a different kind of MRI sort of. 
where uh, it showed blood flow. And the cancer area was getting no blood flow. So he said, I think you got dead tissue. Because on MRIs, uh, cancer and dead tissue show up as they look the same. Um, so you can't really go by that. Um, yeah, so uh, I just zoned out for a minute. So yeah, so that was like, yeah, so it was all right. So we got off the, yeah, I was off the chemo and we did the CT scan. He said, okay, it's no blood flow. So then it became a, a question is, okay, every year just do an MRI. And then I was still on that Kepler and stuff like that. And I was, got my uh, um, Eckhart Tully rolling. So I was very much trying to be in my moment, really be, gr practice gratitude and being grateful for what I had. And, you know, definitely had some, some stressors and, and I definitely failed on a, on a regular basis. But I was really trying to practice that whole, like, going easy on myself and like, yeah, all right. I mean, I was still trying to do stuff pretty hard. And, uh, the business wasn't really working out. You know, it was like a, a mom pop. So mom and pop weren't getting along too well with the, with the retail shop. Really didn't want to lose that because I didn't really know what else I could do. I was really still having some cognitive issues. I would have a difficult time going from one room to the next and kind of remember, like, why was I there? <laughs> what was I doing there? But, I mean, I, I really just practiced that, you know, kind of going easy on yourself because you can just, like, and kind of say, all right, this is the, the, new, the new thing. Uh, and then with the, the cancer, I just kept going um, yearly. And then I wanted to go after a certain point, maybe like 10 years out or something. I wanted to go like every two years. I was like, because this is getting a little redundant. You know, going in, you're paying a lot of money, even with cheap. And uh, yeah, so it was. Um, so it was going pretty good and I changed insurance to that, the kind of closed, but we had, I had other, it did pretty good, I think, though I had a problem with ordering stuff because I, it was kind of like a kid in a, in a, in a uh, candy store. Uh, but, and then we had the VP oil spill. Yeah. And I, it seemed like it was something else that happened. I can't really remember, but it just put a damper on beachwear. But, uh. Yeah, so, oh, and then, then at that, okay, so we then we closed the shop, and then I was like, man, I just didn't know what to do. Oh, and I started doing, I got back to my art, because I do a lot, I draw a lot. I've always been into art since I was a kid, drawing and, and painting and stuff, and I took a, uh, and then studied later at, uh, so I was a little too arrogant to, to learn much in an art school. But uh, anyway, oh, yeah, so I did a, a kid's book. And because uh, I, I started on, like, I love photography, video, like, I like anything narrative on the art form. I like that kind of uh, thing, like stories. And one of my favorites was, like, going out and trying to get, like, different, um, like, an old photograph or a character. And then you just kind of, you just had some connection to it. I don't know why. And then it was like, you kind of make that your, your protagonist or something. And then just start running with it. Make up a, you know, life backstory. And then start putting that character in your art and stuff like that. And so I did that with a, uh, with a black Indian, which I'd always been into tribal stuff and that, that, you know, our, our thing with the, uh, the, uh, you know, African American community and then the cause and so forth back in the day, kind of commingling, intermarrying, and then kind of breeding what our, you know, our, our uh, black Indian tribe. So anyway, so I had a, my, my Indian that I, I, I kind of bonded with over this, this really faded old photograph that I found, I had to almost make up his suit. And, uh, but anyways, it was called Spy, I wrote a kid's book and I illustrated it too. And I had like forgotten how to draw, it was kind of sad. But, uh, but I just loved like the narrative and just keep, you know, keeping like a repetitive, like kind of pattern, like this character, like I just love. Because it reminded me also of what's that other kid's book that's real famous? Um, the kid in the suit, uh, where where the wild things are. Yeah, I don't know. Something about the suit reminded me, and the ears reminded because my Indian had had uh, like a his his uh, his headdress had like kind of ears on it, and uh, and that may have been me just thinking about. I mean, it wasn't like like a, what do you call it? 
conscious. It was like, you know, like a subliminal. And I noticed it, I think maybe in doing the book, I was like, well, the tribe are the monsters, and then he's that little kid. And anyway, so I, uh, I sent it into Pelican. I had like a lot. So I was, I was, I was getting a little down. And uh, so I was like, all right. And I was telling everybody, yeah, I'm going to write a kid's book. And I'm like, yeah, right. You and everybody else. So anyway, I, I sent it in. And then I got accepted. And so that was pretty cool. So I was very excited at first with that. I was like, wow, that's awesome. And then I had to draw it. And, and then it just put me into a real kind of time crunch. And then they, the publisher had their own ideas that I didn't really agree with for the, the aesthetic of the book. Um, and I almost <laughs> said, no, I don't want to do that. And then they were like, well, then we, we're not going to publish your book then. Because they, you know, they're putting money into it, so I get it. But they're trying to like, kind of make it more cookie cutter. But uh, and I wasn't that into it. But I, I gave in. I was like, man, I can't lose this opportunity. So anyway, the name of my book was Spy Boy, Cheyenne, and Ninety Six Grand. So the, it's about an eight year old. It's first person narrative, which I love. So it's kind of like a Huckleberry Finn kind of thing. And so it was a really good like rehab for me because I had my. Motor skills had gotten a little poor, I would say, and my definitely my mind, you know, that whole coordination of that. So it was a really healing process. But it was pretty manic too. Like actually doing the book, I the illustration. It took me about a day to do each uh, the day to do each illustration. And uh, so for one day, I'd go, "Oh man, this is brilliant. Uh, this is this is so good." And then the next would be like. Uh, Oh, you know, this is total junk. You're the worst. <laughs> and it would literally, it was like, that to be almost like a joke. Um, and a uh, total joke with that. And, uh, oh, I had another call that fried me. So, yeah, but I stuck with it. And like I said, it was a really good, I think art, art rehab is so healthy. And my latest thing has been, uh, has been music. Um, I don't really play anything, but I always liked uh, poetry and, and writing. And uh, so lately it's been kind of like a, a music thing. But I want to get back to the, uh, to the art, too. I got two other or three other books I'd like to – like I want to say they're going to be more graphic now. And I would say my first book isn't really a kid's book because it's first-person narrative. So that's like it's a child telling you a story. It doesn't mean it's a kid's you know, story per se. And uh, anyway, the kid loves colors, and he, he calls every color that he sees by the crayon color name, you know, kind of funky stuff. And, and then he gets a little lost, but you have to read the book. But, uh, yeah, so, man, got something not to call me anymore. I don't know how to scream my call. So, so the whole... Uh, Oh, okay, so where are we at? Okay, so yeah, so after that, so I had that. So I've been doing then MRIs, MRIs, MRIs every year. It shows the same thing, same thing, same thing. So, uh-oh. <laughs> like, I don't know, like two months ago? And I still don't really know what's going on. I, still, I just did my MRI yesterday. So they found something over my brain stem and, and uh, uh, what is it, your cerebellum. So I think it's mainly over my brainstem, and that area is not for like surgery or any of that kind of stuff. So that was kind of a real eye opener. And uh, so I was like, oh shit! So this is this is I'm back to doing this because I totally kind of wiped this out of my my head outside of you know my daily routines and adapting to my my brain alterations. But uh, yeah, so now I'm back in the mix. I'm back on chemo. But I'm taking that thing that I had taken before it in Houston called Timidar, but it's a much higher, like I said, they changed things 14 years, so they've learned some stuff. So it's all, it's really jacked up, but it's an oral tablet, so it's not injection. And, uh, but I do get kind of ill on it, and it, it doesn't feel good. So I do it for five days, and then at the end of the month, they do it a, you know, a lab work, so I'm going to see how I'm doing. Um, so that's that's been, they've been an eye opener. I did not see this coming back, and I got I got a little too too cocky with it. I, I think um, what I found out is that this is more the norm. That these GBMs that's part of the the thing with 
well, I haven't met anybody and I don't know of anybody that's 14 years out with being diagnosed with a GBM. So that's pretty, I'm grateful for that. Though I'm extending my shout out to the universe for uh, extended time because my daughter is about to turn 18. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm going to go for, I think my dad came up with something good, but I forgot. But I'll have to pray on that. Anyway, the moral of the story is to stay real positive with your, your thing. I'll, I'll bring on some, in the upcoming things, I'll bring on for some chats, some actual doctors and stuff like that. And some other, I also did Reiki, which was really huge on helping my, my mental attitude and kind of making peace with uh just going through life, really. I mean, it's all the same kind of thing. It's like, this is puts your end date here as like a, your fleshy end as, you know, so, but it's just like the same thing you're living, even if you're not dealing with cancer or something like that. It's all, we're all in the same boat. Uh, and time, I was really looking at on this last one when I got that, I was like, wow, you know, this, mo I was like trying to get into my moment, like doing that kind of Eckhart Tully kind of vibe. And I was like, all right, this could be like a total eternity, you know, like this one little moment. I was just laying in bed. And I was like, oh, okay. So this, this is back. So it's pretty wild. But uh, no, but I'm very grateful and I'm happy to be able to share this with you. And we'll do some stuff for some more health issue related things because I think there's a lot that's being done for uh, diets. I think a lot of this is caused by our environment and, and things we're, we're putting into our bodies on a daily basis. And a lot of this stuff is not natural. And I think that's a, uh, a, key, a key thing to it is really getting back on a more healthy, natural uh, a dietary stuff. Like right now I just went uh, carnivore. <laughs> I think your brain, I could be wrong, I think your brain is like all fat. So, uh, so that's the, uh, that's what I'm thinking. But, and so eating like highlights of fat is supposed to be really good for this. And, 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 uh, and uh, oh, you want to like starve. I think that's the word I'm hearing a lot of is starving your, is your cancer. So I'd like to kind of incorporate that into my life. But this is, I'd like to end off with the, uh, my monkey mind. So this is a song I wrote and the priest is on, is on guitar. All right. Anyway, lots of love you guys. Y'all take care and I will see you next Saturday. All right, trial by fire. Hey, Kimo. I, I miss. I heard about at least three quarters of it. <laughs> I was trying to get it on in the like, phone. I just missed. I was listening in the car. Why are those pointed here? Oh, yeah. Oh, because I have your phone. Three phantom guests. <laughs> well, we're one, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Cool, Daddy O. Awesome, brother. You're a brave fella. <laughs> you definitely are. God bless you. God bless you.